March is celebrated every year as the Month of the Disabled. But for those with a disability, the challenges are year-round. On this one-on-one, -on -one, we speak with two people, one who has risen above his disability to excel and the other a mother who understands the challenges of taking care of a son with a disability. And a very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord, and my special guest is the president of the Barbados Down Syndrome Association, Miss Asha Aline Renwick. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Lisa. You're most welcome. Now, I want to start by looking at the condition. If you could just explain in detail what Down Syndrome is. Down Syndrome. So, Down Syndrome is a genetic condition, and it occurs when an individual has three copies of chromosome 21. So a typical or normal, I dislike that word, but a typical mm -hmm. individual would have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. With Down syndrome, the 21st chromosome is tripled. So instead of having a pair of 21 of the 21st chromosome, the individual has three copies. And in each cell of the body, there's this triple chromosome. So really, Down syndrome is a genetic condition caused by more genetic material, excess genetic material, which is caused by a tripling of the 21st chromosome in each cell of the body. And the condition causes cognitive um, disabilities? Yes. yes, it causes, well, with Down syndrome, an individual with Down syndrome usually falls between the mild to moderate um, category of cognitive disability. Um, it also causes physical different physical characteristics. Um, an individual would have like a flatter facial profile, maybe shorter, also lower set ears, um, a condition known as hypotonia, where the muscle tone is, is lower than a typical individual. Um, it also comes with some other conditions, early onset Alzheimer's disease, um, thyroid conditions. I'm starting to sound like I'm sounding a little negative, but these are all um, treatable conditions. So even though the individual might be born with say a heart defect because 50% of yes. babies with Down syndrome are born with a heart, some type of congenital heart defect, but uh, that as well is treatable. So the lifespan of individuals with Down syndrome has actually increased over the years due to access to, to medical care. And I wanna put things in context. You mm -hmm. first knew about Down syndrome yes. on an intimate level after Ashton, your yes. son, was born. He's yes. 11 now, He's 11. but take me yes. back to when he was born. Did you mm -hmm. know before he was born? Because I know that there are tests available, mm -hmm. or was it just after he was born? It was after he was born, so my, my situation was a bit different. I was 29 when I had him, so I didn't have, I wasn't expected, and I had a pretty regular pregnancy, regular checkups. Um, we had no abnormalities at the time, so we had a, a surprise diagnosis, so to speak, when he was a day old or so. So he was born that evening, and the next day when the pediatrician came in to release us from, from hospital, to sign us out, and would have, you know, mommy gets the checkup, and then they come in, the pediatrician comes to check baby. That's when we found out. They did the check, and they looked at him, and that's when I found out that he was, he did have Down syndrome. No, you said he was born the evening, so you did not even realize. I did not realize myself. It sounds pretty strange to some people, but for me, I, I and it might sound a bit funny, but when he was born, I, I did for one split second thing, okay, child has slanted eyes, probably hubby has some Chinese <laughs> heritage at that time, laughing now, but I, I didn't pick up. Neither did the obstetrician that delivered him, in fact, at the time. Um, he was healthy, he was eight and a half pounds, he was, he didn't have any issues that we knew up front at birth. But it was the pediatrician that identified the physical characteristics that I would have just spoken about. So the muscle tone, which is something that might not be obvious to, to the ordinary eye. But at the time, she was able to show me, well, his tone is a little bit lower. They de describe it at that time as feeling floppy, mm -hmm. that baby feels floppy. I didn't pick it up, but she pointed it out. Um, he didn't have the single palmar crease, which is the one crease across the hand, which is sometimes some babies with Down syndrome would have that one, one crease across their hand. What else? He did have the slanty eyes that I spoke about um, that she was able to, to say was one of the um, characteristics. I'm trying to remember what else he had. Sometimes they have um, excess fat to the back of their, their neck. Yeah, so she pointed out those. All of these things are things that can be present in the general population. Mm -hmm. But when you see them together, those are some of the markers that the doctors look for to, to identify Down syndrome. When the doctor told you Ashton has mm. Down syndrome, what mm. was your 
initial reaction? Shock. I was shocked. Like, it wasn't on my radar. I didn't think about it. I was 29. I also have a daughter before him who's typical. So it wasn't, so I was shocked. I went through a, a process. At first it was, couldn't find the words. And then it was grief for a little while, crying. Like, why me? I went through that whole why me stage. What, what did I do kind of stuff? The, the doctor kind of explained to me that with Down syndrome, it's not a situation where it's anything environmental or is it anything that you could have done to cause the, the condition. It wasn't any behavior or anything. It's, it is what they call um, scientific anomaly, something that just happens, that science hasn't been able to, to explain why why the cells, um, well, you refer to non-disjunction Down syndrome. So it is connected to cell division and cells dividing and what, what some people call sticky cells. So it is, it happens at conception and it, it, was, it was a shock to find out, but, but I, I got over it, I think, quickly, pretty quickly. Because of course you have beautiful baby there to, to cheer you up. And how has it been dealing with Ashton? It has been fun, interesting, an eye-opener, a lot more love than I've ever experienced before. Um, I remember a nurse telling me in hospital, this child is going to bring you so much love, mommy. And she was, she was right. She really was right. It's been, I can't say it's been easy though. It's been quite challenging, especially here in Barbados, where even though we, we are moving towards inclusion and we're trying to, to improve and we've seen special needs make a lot of a lot of advancements over the years, but we're still, we still have a way to go. So it's still a struggle as a parent raising a child with special needs in Barbados. So it has been a challenge, but then there are highs and lows as with everything in life. Yes. I want to come back to the challenges, but I know mm. that through Ashton, you would have started the Barbados Down Syndrome yes. Association. Tell me yes. about starting that association. So we started back when Ashton was about two, two years old. So back in 2012, if I'm adding correctly, um, I just felt the need at that time for a support group. Like when he was born, I, there wasn't any active um, support group or even an association to say, well, this is where you turn to, to, to get information. So of course you turn to the internet and you see all these scary stories and the child will never walk and the child will have to be institutionalized. And so it was scary. And I said, you know, I don't want anybody else to have to, to go through this. Let's, I just literally went out looking for, <laughs> looking for parents and calling up and going to the development center and give, sharing out my name. And I would go to the physical therapy and see some parents and I would talk to them. So we started out as a, a support group whereby doctors would give um, new diagnosed parents, mothers most of the time, my, my phone number and they would do a lot of talking and counseling and, and we would meet and, you know, get to see babies and get to know one another. But then we moved on from being a support group to becoming a registered charity where we were trying to do a little bit, a little bit more um, outside of the support group, but we're still very um, support um, based in terms of I still get calls with new moms that just, just found out and you know, may not be handling it too well, maybe in a process, maybe a denial or, or the, whole, the whole process. So we, we like to be here for new parents especially. And what, beyond the support, what other activities mm -hmm. is your association involved in? Over the years, we've been able to get involved in a number of activities. COVID really mm -hmm. put a whole, like, pause on everything, especially with our kids who are more susceptible um, to especially any respiratory type of infection. So we were kind of on the down low for a while, but we were still involved in like giving out hampers to, to members and helping out financially because as it, the time was hard for everyone, but especially with a child with special needs, sometimes there are different concerns that we have to address. We've had workshops. We were able to start a program in December, Get Active with Down Syndrome. And we did this along with Akeem Rudder from Include you Sports Academy, and that was wonderful. And we got the children out because of course they've been home and like us, they've been putting our weight and, and, and not moving. So we were able to get them out and get them active and involved in, in sports, which is the first. And we started with the parent support work, um, workshop as well. Where we just spoke, Akim was able to speak to the parents about the importance of exercise, the importance of believing. Of course we believe in our kids, but he, it's good to hear someone else for change, you know, have that type of belief and, and support in our children. So we've been doing, we've been doing stuff.
you mentioned that you yourself went through a period of grief, as mm. you call it. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're finding a lot with new mm -hmm. parents that mm -hmm. might have a child with mm -hmm. Down syndrome, newly diagnosed? I find new, new, yeah. When you, when you just receive the diagnosis, I think shock is the first, especially if it is a postnatal um, diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Some some parents would have, some moms would have had the amnio during mm -hmm. pregnancy, depending on whether or not the doctor thinks it is necessary. I was 29 and, and it wasn't thought necessary at that time to do those, so there are a variety of tests. There's a new test now that you can do, a blood test that can tell you um, whether or not the child, up to a certain amount of a percentage um, of correction, being correct, can't find a word, but yes, there's a blood test that can be done, but we also offer a variety of tests here in Barbados as well. But most of the times they give you the odds, but not the certainty whether or not. So when a parent gets a diagnosis postnatally before any you know, um, lead up to it, they tend to go through a, a, a period of, of grief. And I guess because the information out there is so negative, because even in my experience, what I knew of Down syndrome was, was negative. So it's not that, you know, you get that, you don't really see the light at the end of the tunnel in the beginning. But as baby starts to grow, and of course you have that support and you can pick up the phone and call and, and especially the celebrating of small milestones. I mean, we, we did a lot for like walking was a party and sitting up was a, you know, we really celebrate those and allowing us to celebrate and doing those things helps to make the journey a lot, a lot easier. And the kids are so lovable and they're so, so kind and so... They're, I'm not, I don't want to say they're easy to raise, but people have the misconception that you get a baby with Down syndrome and it's this, this whole huge difference. The baby's still a baby, you still have to change diapers, he's going to cry at night. And you, so it's, it's, it's kind of similar, but still you have the health concerns sometimes that, especially the heart. The heart is a serious, a serious issue for a lot of our members in terms of accessing the much needed open heart surgery because 50% of our babies are born with a defect and that in itself is a whole a whole issue now especially because I, I remember even being told that Ashton would be to the bottom of the list because he had Down syndrome so and I thought it was just me at that time but I have heard from parents in the association that have had that same experience and it is it's a huge concern for our members now in terms of some may not have health insurance and if you don't have that medical insurance Affording an open heart surgery is a huge thing. And if the child is considered less, I don't want to say <laughs> less worthy of life, but that's what it, it boils down like. It has boiled down to. And that alone has been a huge, a huge problem. I was fortunate in that my son did not, he didn't need the surgery. His holes closed on their own, mm -hmm. but it, that's not the case for some. And then you would imagine what could happen there if the child cannot access the surgery or if it is not prioritized due to the fact that the child has Down syndrome. And that is a major issue we are facing right now. You spoke about misconceptions mm. and off camera, you were telling me that, you know, older women that tend to get pregnant older, mm. you were told that yes. this is a real possibility for them, but not for you because you were 29. That is that is a huge misconception. People hear Down syndrome and immediately, but that's an old, old woman. You know, you get a 45 and you have a baby, a very high, there's a, a high probability, a high likelihood, a higher likelihood. But the fact is that 80% of babies with Down syndrome are actually born to women under 35. Mm -hmm. And people don't think so because they, they, they see it as an old woman or old, old women's um, condition, something that you have to look out for if you have a baby later on in life. Mm -hmm. But because, of course, women under 35 have more babies, Right, then that means that the babies that are actually born more, the prevalence is actually higher under 35. So Down syndrome, it, it, it doesn't um, discriminate age, race, socioeconomic status. It doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. It can happen to anyone, basically. Where are some of the other misconceptions that you wanna highlight mm. or clear up? I would say people think that the children can't learn. Right, and I, I, I realize with Down syndrome because the children wear it on their faces, so you can see it. So immediately you associate it with an a, a inability to do a lot of things. So they assume they can't learn, they can't read, they can't. My, my son is 11, he's reading, he's very intelligent, tricks me all the time. I don't know what that says about me, but he is, he's, he's doing well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does take that support. It takes that assistance, it takes that early stimulation, the dedication and the patience. So I'm not gonna say it's easy, but the belief that they can 
but change, I help to change a lot of these misconceptions. There's also a misconception that along that not being able to to do anything basically, that they they stay childlike forever kind of thing. You know, I was told that I remember when Ashley was once, oh, he can be like that forever till I was like, no, he's not gonna be not if I have anything to do with it. But that is also a misconception that they are forever children. Mm -hmm. And all of that has to do, of course, with how you raise a child. If you if you watch a lot of TV, you would see teenagers with Down syndrome in the States graduating high school and prom cream and open up based, opening up bakeries and different independent ventures. Here, we don't see it as much because we still, we're still guilty of the low expectations mm -hmm. of these individuals. So that's something we would definitely like to see change. I keep hearing you hinting at the lack of support. So let's yes. talk now about the challenges mm -hmm. that persons with Down syndrome are facing on the island. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we, we have a lot of challenges within the association. Um, of course, we would like inclusion to be mm -hmm. a lot more accessible we are not we, we we've heard talk of moving towards inclusion and i'm i'm hoping especially with the recent changes we've had throughout the ministries and what's not that we will see a, a, a bigger push towards inclusion and i don't just mean inclusion in education inclusion in healthcare with the same situation with 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 the heart mm -hmm. inclusion within society it wouldn't be so hard to to find an after school activity to get your child into it might be a football club it might be swimming but because these children do, do look different, that inclusion tends to be a problem. So some of the challenges, yes, relate to inclusion. We also have challenges financially in terms of accessing services. We talk about um, reaching full potential. You can't reach, a child can't reach its full potential, especially with special needs in Barbados, without the adequate services. So we're not at a point yet where we can say, well, the child will get physical therapy twice a week, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all these necessary therapies that we know as parents would help our children reach a certain, a certain point. No. All of these things cost money, and unless you can tell that you can afford all of these, um, the last I checked, speech therapy was like seventy-five dollars a half hour. So if you need that twice a week, well, more than fifty, and you multiply that, and that's just that's just speech. That's not physical. It's not so. It's very expensive. And right now, parents, especially of children with special needs, here are really under a lot of pressure. COVID has happened. We've missed out on a lot of therapies. We've missed out on a lot of. Um, chances for inclusion to get our children socialized so it is tough so financial aid is something that we as a community we really would love to see government rally around the community and provide at least that assistance that the children can access therapies and get the support that they need now you're talking about children but obviously we have adults and, with correct. Um, down syndrome mm -hmm. And I remember coming across an article, mm -hmm. uh, a news story from last year, mm -hmm. where you were calling for the after school support, yes. but more specifically after school, meaning after you've graduated. Yes. Because once they leave those institutions, there's mm -hmm. really no support. There's no support. There is no support. I can't even um, sugarcoat it. After, I, I actually, I, that's one of my concerns, because mm -hmm. my son is 11 and he might be young now, but before, before I look around, as we would say, he'd be 18 and I'll be wondering what, what what is life for him? What I I still consider myself pretty young, so I don't expect to have to be able to or have to stay home with him because there's nowhere for me to send him, and it shouldn't be like that. We should be in a situation where we have at least a roadmap, something in place to say, okay, well, this is what happens for a child with special needs after 18. There's this program here; they can go here, and there are a few here. Not to say that there aren't, there are a few here and there have some individuals that are really working to create that type of um, atmosphere, but it is lacking. It is not easily accessible as yet. So we still worry, we still worry about it. What does the future hold for, for um, a, an adult with Down syndrome in Barbados that isn't going to look like what happened back in the early 90s where the, children, where the adults were institutionalized and, and, and kept that at home. kept at home, kept at home. yes, kept at home for their entire lives. Sometimes you might not even know that there's an adult with a special need within the household. And we really need to make sure that that is not the, the truth of 2022 going forward. But are you finding that still though? I am finding that with, yes, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not saying they're kept inside or they're not taken away institutionalized, but because the opportunity isn't there. And we have a saying that opportunity reveals potential. So if you don't have that opportunity, then, then where do you go? So a lot of, we do have parents that are home. Right? And we have a lot of families that might assist other families or when a parent has to work, you will send the adult here. But it is, it is challenging. It is challenging right across the board.
And what about job prospects mm. for these individuals? We are hoping at the association to be able to create or work towards building out those type of opportunities. We have a lead program, uh, our umbrella program, where we focus on life skills, education, athletics, and developmental skills. So we are hoping ourselves to create that roadmap for, for our members, whereby you get the diagnosis, you know where to go. You know about, okay, at two months, we're gonna start with this. This is what toddler age looks like. This is what teenage years looks like. And this is what's gonna happen after the child is, is grown. That is what we, we really need that type of framework here. So it wouldn't be so scary. So the next diagnosis in the next five years, you wanna have a mother crying because they don't know, you know what life will be like. Or it feels like all hope is lost. So we, mm -hmm. let me just go back just a little in terms of we, we spoke about the challenges um, after 18 years old mm. in terms of the institutions that cater to children with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. Do you have mm -hmm. enough? We have, well, the institutions mean education, right? Correct. Because we have, we in Barbados, we still use this um, special unit system. Okay. So within, so you get the diagnosis. My mm -hmm. son went to Erdison Special School. Mm -hmm. was a good experience for him. We are hoping to see in the future more inclusion. Um, I believe my son could have been educated within a typical setting, right? But being a teacher myself, I know the challenges within the education system itself. So I didn't feel comfortable um, with him within the typical setting because I didn't want a situation where he just went into school and he was included for the sake of being included. I wanted to make sure that he was being taken care of, taught to his potential and receiving that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, here in Barbados, we have the um, we have Charles F. Boone Special Unit, Ellerton Special Unit, we have Eagle Hall, All Saints, and then secondary school, there's Anne Hill, Challenger, they have some private, which will be Challenger and Learning Center, mm -hmm. Derek Smith, where my son is at now. So we have, within the education system, yes, we have, we do have institutions for children with special needs. But I think at this point, I'm moving forward, that is exactly the problem. We don't want to move forward into a, a situation where the children are separated. Right. I went to Charles F. Broome and I remember very vividly the special unit there and, and, and the fear and the everything that surrounded, you know, those the children that were in the unit. And it, it that's the dark ages. And as a, a life is ironic because as an adult now with my son with Down syndrome and it, it puts a whole different light on on what that experience is. I remember I had to, I delivered a, a, a lecture. I did a workshop there at the, the unit. And I remember going down, I hadn't been there since I went to Charles F. Broome, and it was shocking for me to, to just see that the, that this it, it was the same unit as when I went to school. So we, we need to try to move away from this whole separation. So these children are different and they're special and they're downstairs, or these children are in the unit over there. When the truth is, um, the majority of these children, if you include them, they will succeed, but they will not succeed without the support. Mm -hmm. They will not succeed without the, the teacher's aides. They will not su succeed without the IEPs. So we need the support in place for them if we want them to be included. World Down Syndrome Day is celebrated on March 21st. Yes. And you started the Rock Your Socks campaign yes. a few years ago to mark the day. How yes. have Barbadians responded to that campaign? We have been overwhelmed at the response. Mm -hmm. um, I, I considered bringing it here and I, it was a little, I wonder if um, Barbadians would take it up, if it's something that would do well here. I was overwhelmed that first year back in 2019. Yes, where we started and it just caught on. It caught on and I'm, I'm very pleased at the response. We are trying to move forward now to more um, awareness raising and also fundraising, of course, because we don't want people to just rock their socks. We want them to understand why are we rocking their socks? And we rock our socks because one, of course, their conversation started because who walks around in a dress and tall socks? <laughs> and that, that, that is one of the reasons behind it. You know, you get the conversation started. We're wearing these pretty socks for Down syndrome awareness. And you are able to share. Also, the socks were chosen because they tend to look like, um, chromosomes when right. you hang them up next to each other. So the brightly colored socks, they are a conversation starter and they're really to raise awareness and also to help eradicate, eradicate some of the stigma, stigma, right? The stigma attached to the condition. Because before before I started, I found you couldn't even say Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. 
I remember people like whispering, he's like, don't like, not that kind of like, it's this taboo thing. Nobody wants to say it. Nobody wants to speak well, we about it. And I think we've moved past that, that so. now. I think we've gone, I think people are, I heard someone telling me they're going to bite um, Down syndrome socks. And yeah, so I, I think even though it might seem minor, it really, mm. it is, it is a change. It makes a difference. And especially for our members and our parents, because a lot of them, even some of them with the older, older um, adults would have come up in a Barbados where yeah where it was whispered where it was whispered right so actually getting to put their 30 year old or their 40 year old in socks and recognize that Barbados is supporting them and, and celebrating I, I know it's making a difference but how yes. do Barbadians support the initiative beyond right now beyond wearing the socks, beyond wearing the socks. and mm -hmm. that's where we're at now in terms of how how do we move beyond just wearing the socks on the day and we get the information not only out there but to get more impact, you know, if I've had a lot of calls, people wanting to know how can we get involved. And I find they also want to get to meet the children, which I think it is a huge part. When we sold socks last time, I think in 2019, we were able to have one or two members around and, you know, so they will actually get to see the faces of these individuals with Down syndrome that they might not see, these people that they might not see on a regular basis. We also want support in terms of, uh, we are in our beginning stages, but we would love to have a home base. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm appealing <laughs> to the public because we don't have a we don't have a home right. per se. So a lot of people are asking, you know, like, where can I get my socks? Is some way that we can come and collect them? And of course, are all the programs that we wish to to carry out. So we really need that that base, that building, that home. So we really would love love to raise funds to help us to help us on that to help us achieve that goal basically through the selling of socks, of course. And of course, we also always encourage the public to to donate. Don't just wear the socks, but also donate to the association. And I, we know this time of year, people start to sell socks. The retailers sell socks and they do well. So we're also appealing to them as well to, to give back to the association, understanding that the money is used to help further our initiatives and of course to support our members with Down syndrome. But how do I get in contact with you to buy the socks? You can contact me at 843-9948. And you'll always get me, I'll answer the phone. Our email address is dsbarbados at gmail.com. And of course, we are on social media. We are on Facebook at Barbados Down Syndrome Association. And we are also on IG at Barbados Down Syndrome 246. If you had one single wish yes. for not just the association, but those living with Down Syndrome, what would it be? Well, that's an excellent question. That they can be raised or they can grow up in a society that fully accepts them and, and believes in them and believes in their potential and helps to support them in every way possible. An accepting, inclusive society. That's what I hope to see for individuals with Down syndrome, including my son at 11. Yes. Miss Alina Renwick, thank you so much for thank talking you to us. So we much. wish you all the best and Ashton thank, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Miss Asha Aline Renwick, the president of the Barbados Down Syndrome Association. When we return, we speak to a young man who has risen above his disability. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Dr. Adana Grandison, and I'm here to give you a few tips on how to accurately and safely take your blood pressure readings at home. Before taking your measurement, sit in a calm, warm environment. Don't perform any exercise in the preceding one hour. No coffee, food, smoking, or even sinus medication in the preceding hour to take in that blood pressure reading. Empty your bladder and bowel. Most readings that are taken at home should be below or at 135 on 85 millimeters of mercury for uncomplicated hypertension. Lower home blood pressure targets might be advisable in persons who have the following conditions. Diabetes, chronic renal disease, or coronary heart disease. If several readings are above 140 or 90 millimeters of mercury, make an appointment with your physician immediately. Ensure to take your readings at the same time every day. We advise two readings in the morning and two readings in the evening initially to profile yourself taken one to two minutes apart. However, 
Once you have established a baseline, you can choose a time suitable to your schedule where you can monitor your blood pressure readings. I am Lloyd Gallo, artificial inseminator attached to the pig improvement program in the Ministry of Agriculture. There is a deadly disease lurking on our doorstep. The African swine fever, the ASF, has been detected in the Dominican Republic. This disease is deadly. If that disease strikes, all your pigs can die. For those farmers who usually utilize the traveling boar, both the farmer who receives the traveling boar service and the farmer who operates the traveling boar service must keep their premises clean, disinfect regularly, bathe that animal, keep that boar in a separate pen, if possible, downwind from the rest of the herd. When operating the service, take along with you a basin, your brush, and your soap so that you can disinfect before and after. There is a safer alternative. The Pig Improvement Program offers insemination to the general public. And you can get more information about this by simply calling the Ministry of Agriculture 535-5958-5957 or 5956. When feeding or dealing with your animals, have a set of clothes that is worn only for that purpose. If you're going from your farm to somewhere else, remove those clothes and wash them regularly. Do not feed swill. Swill is all these scraps and pieces of potato peeling that is left over after you prepare your dinner. If that swill contains infected meat, it can bring that disease onto your farm. We have to be very careful. For this disease, there is no cure, there is no vaccine, there is no treatment. Help us keep African swine fever out of Barbados. Welcome back. My second guest is one of the island's newest government senators, Senator Andwele Boyce. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Now, you were diagnosed with cerebral palsy just after your birth. You said, yes. um, speaking to you off camera, your mother would have recognized that things were a little different. Mm -hmm. And then she got the diagnosis. And it affects your mobility. Yes. But if you could just explain to viewers what cerebral palsy is. So for me, cerebral palsy is uh, affects my my fine motor. So it affects the way that I walk, the way that I write. Um, I often say that my gait is very dissimilar to a quote unquote normal person. So the my the way that I walk looks mm -hmm. different to the way that you would walk. Um, the hamstrings um, throughout my legs are as a result quite tight and work tighter um, in, in, in years gone by and prior to surgeries and that kind of a thing. Um, throughout my childhood, I used mobility aids, leg braces, canes and crutches and that kind of a thing to assist with my walking. No, you mentioned surgeries. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about these surgeries. So my particular diagnosis required that I have multiple surgeries growing throughout the years um, because as you grow you get taller and it is required that your hamstrings are are for want of a better term loosened so that you have greater comfort in walking and that kind of a thing so there are about three or four surgeries related to um, loosening for want of a better term my hamstrings how difficult was it for you going through school, for instance, with your condition? Um, initially, it, it was a challenge. I think we have to put this in context, mm -hmm. context being that this was the 90s. Right. And in many respects, people did not know what to do with disability. There weren't a lot of children in mainstream schools with disabilities. I do have a physical challenge, but I don't have an intellectual challenge. And so that circumstance necessitated that I be in a quote-unquote regular classroom um, and that wasn't always met with with support by teachers and educational administrators and the like and so the, that was the kind of largest challenge um, in relation to my peers once you explain to children um, 
that someone is a little different to them and explain how they are different and and they themselves recognize that um the difference is not a barrier to you know getting to know people and and proper interaction then they're fine how did you deal with the stigma for lack of a better word that came with the condition because people did not understand it mm -hmm. um you fight it you you fight it um when that is required and in other circumstances you sometimes you you have to brush it off because if you've spent your entire life um fighting in fighting what is intolerance and discrimination and that kind of a thing then what happens is that your entire life becomes about um about that challenge and that is not a luxury you have as a child who's trying to go through school and learn and develop and have fun and friends and do all of those things. So you fight when needs be and then there are other times you just kind of ignore it and move on. Did you ever feel discriminated against? Oh, absolutely. So one of the major challenges I had was around, again, integrating into the, the mainstream classroom. I had no intellectual challenges and there was some opposition to me being in the, the regular classroom uh, because, again, back in the 90s, there was a perception that physical challenges meant that you could not um, academically assimilate and, and retain information and the like. So, yes, I remember being very distraught about the fact that, that teachers didn't want me in their classroom, or some teachers, let me be very clear, didn't want me in their classrooms, or that when it was time to do the common entrance, there was some opposition to me doing it. How old were you when you felt that discrimination? Well, I was right around 11 plus mm -hmm. age. And, and the, the interesting thing about that discrimination is that it was such a counter to what I was experiencing in other parts of my life. So the discrimination was in many ways centered in the, in the school environment, but I was going home to a family and, and friends who said, who were saying to me, you were competent, you can achieve what anybody else achieves and we expect you to. Mm -hmm. And so it was quite the um, dichotomy, if you will, between those two experiences. And you've always had that very good family support. Absolutely. Uh, my parents um, have always encouraged me to do my very best at, at everything and, and supported me if, throughout the years in so doing. Well, you clearly have not let your disability get in the way. You're a law student at the Normandy Law School yes. in your second year, your final yes. year. Yes. How has that been? Law school for everybody is a challenge. I am saying. Um, and so it was, it is, it is hectic on, mm -hmm. on most days. And now we have the challenges of learning virtually right. uh, brought on by the COVID pandemic. But it has been an enriching and enlightening experience um, generally. And what area of law are you hoping to specialize in when you're finished? So I am particularly, in, in, certainly in relation to the traditional areas of law, I'm mm -hmm. particularly interested in the civil side. And then, of course, um, having gone through the experience of uh, discrimination and living with a disability, there are elements of public law that I am interested in as well. And you refer to yourself as a disability and a human rights advocate. What are you most concerned about when it comes to disabilities across the board in Barbados? The thing that concerns me in 2022 is the almost the absence of comprehensive disability legislation that makes it so that persons with disabilities do not have to be discriminated right. against um, that on the basis of their disability in relation to employment, in relation to education, in relation to, to any of those other things. And that those laws rather would create an enabling environment for persons with disabilities to contribute to their society. Because I think Lisa, the thing that I, I, I think we have to reshift our thinking about is that persons with disabilities are not only beneficiaries of a system, they want to contribute to the system as well. And I think a comprehensive disability protections and legislation would allow them to do that. 
Wouldn't you say, though, that things have improved since back in the 90s when you would have faced discrimination? Oh, absolutely. Um, although there is um, no comprehensive legislation, there is, you know, uh, a spattering of, of provisions here and there, I think we have progressed culturally. So now there's an understanding in that you tr you should treat persons with disabilities with some degree of regard. We have a, a far way to go still. So more but, or less an acceptance. Yes, but we but we have made some ground. Now I came across an article you wrote back in 2017. I'm hoping you remember because I know you've <laughs> written quite a bit of articles. Uh, it was titled "Disability, Mobility, and Dependence." Mm -hmm. um, you expressed your want to be more independent. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you have struggled with? I think, yes, to answer your question. Um, it is something that I think many persons with disabilities struggle with because remember that depending on your disability, mm -hmm. the world is not made for you, for, for want of a better term. And so certainly in my case, I think what I was writing about in that article mostly was the fact that I could not then drive and I still can't drive and and we know the the how the ability to drive impacts a, a teenager's of course, independence of course. Um, mm -hmm. and so little things like that I think uh, were challenges for me and, and perhaps remain challenges for me and and going back to the article as well mm -hmm. again I hope you remember mm -hmm. um, you were talking about yes it is the dream of every teenager to learn to drive mm -hmm. but you were also learning to walk all over again based on um, a number of surgeries you yes. had take me through that yes so I think the thing about a disability and, and and my experience with disability is that you you take the wings where they where you you find them mm -hmm. and the thing that was my concern at that my principal concern at that time was the ability to relearn to walk just a couple of years after surgery i was still very much you know getting my footing again in in bilateral terms and so um the ability to drive although a desire was not the most important thing in terms of the support from institutions you've had a great family support structure but mm -hmm. in terms of the institutional support mm -hmm. um this is at the tertiary level mm -hmm. for, for people like yourself mm -hmm. or therapy, etc. Is it there? In some instances it is. Um, and in many instances it is not. Uh, I think, like I, I averred to culture just now, and I think because acceptance is becoming more of the norm, you may find um, individuals in particular organizations who are committed to making it easier for persons with disabilities to exist in and traverse through those organizations. However, there remains a need for those accommodations to be at a structural level. Um, and when I say at a structural level, I mean ingrained in policy so that it is not a favor that um, a particular uh, um, officer of, or a person in an institution is doing for any person and with a disability, but that they're required to do whatever, whatever accommodation is required. As I mentioned in my introduction, you mm -hmm. are one of the island's newest government senators. How did it feel when you first found out that you'll be taking up a seat in the upper house? Um, shock. <laughs> uh, you get that call and you think, Really? Um, no, well, I, I certainly was not expecting um, a call from, from the Prime Minister inviting me to sit in the upper house. And so the only thing that could have, ex that could explain how I felt was shock. Are you looking forward to it? Absolutely. I'm looking forward to adding my voice to the national conversation around disability, around issues of youth around issues of climate and gender justice and so many of the issues because I, I am a, a person with a disability but I'm also a young person mm -hmm. in, in Barbados and, and there are many issues that uniquely affect um, the, the nation's young people and so I am looking forward to adding my voice to that conversation and, and being of service to, to Barbados in any way that I can.
if you had one wish, as I just asked the president of the Barbados Down Syndrome Association, mm -hmm. for persons with disabilities across the board, mm -hmm. what would it be? That's a tough one, Lisa. <laughs> just one. Um, it would be that Barbados makes good on its promise of creating the enabling environment for persons with disabilities so that they don't have to grow up, particularly young persons with disabilities, don't have to grow up um, being defined by the things that they can't do, that they are given the opportunity to contribute to, in whatever ways they wish, to the development of this country. Senator Boyce, thank you so much for being so open and transparent with us. We're looking forward to your contributions in the Upper House when you do sit. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. That's Senator Anne Dwele Boyce, a disability and human rights advocate. I am Lisa Lord, and this was One on One. Good evening.